eventually receive this document, so don't freak out and try to type down everything. All right, so everybody, no typing, just think and listen, right? I think about the Fourth Amendment in particular from the standpoint of flow charts and matrices. It's, it's a series of yes, no questions with options that go in different directions. And the trick is to fill in all of your knowledge so that you can understand the flow you can read a fact pattern and know where in the flow of knowledge it fits, right? So for, so for the Fourth Amendment, for example, the first question you're going to learn we always ask is, is the government involved? Because there is no Fourth Amendment right to privacy against your neighbor. You know, you, might ha you may have some civil rights, but you don't have a Fourth Amendment issue. And after I ask if the government is involved, I'm going to need to know if there's a reasonable expectation of privacy that has been violated by the government's intrusion. So, for example, should the government be allowed uh, to, um, to use a device that lets them look through the walls of my home to see what I'm doing inside? Should the government be allowed to fly over my home and look down from a helicopter? Should the government be allowed to put a drone in the air and fly it in my backyard and, and photograph? Do I have an expectation of privacy there? So that's, and we'll learn those expectations of privacy and that it's both a subjective and an objective standard. We're going to learn that. Now, if there is not government intrusion, or if there is no reasonable expectation of privacy, the Fourth Amendment is not going to apply, and whatever the government found, they're going to be able to use. Or whatever your private person found, they're going to be able to use. But sometimes, there is a reasonable expectation of privacy. And if there is, the next question that I ask is whether or not probable cause has been established. And we threw probable cause out in class in our very first day, we all kind of ran to that as an idea, right? PC is one of those things that, that is the, one of the tricks of the trade as we deal with this stuff. If I have probable cause, I then ask, was there a search warrant? And if there was a search warrant, the evidence obtained is admissible. That line down the left-hand side of this particular diagram is pretty much uh, a flowchart expression of the Fourth Amendment as it is written in the Constitution except for the reasonable expectation of privacy. Uh, and the reasonable expectation of privacy is an interpretation of reasonably um, that they'll be secure. It's, it's that clause in the Fourth Amendment. That's relatively straightforward. It's relatively applicable. But the problem is, is that life is not straightforward and life is not applicable. And the courts had to deal with all the times where there was a, a reasonable expectation of privacy, but there was no probable cause or they didn't get the warrant. And so they've created that big box right there. Every one of those exceptions is a case or cases where the court has created an out for the government, a way in which even though the Constitution, as written, would not admit the evidence, we're going to let it happen anyway. And there's all these tests, and I'll just kind of read them out. Um, consent. Search incident to apprehension, stop and frisk, inspections, border searches, inventories, sobriety checkpoints, employee search, medical purpose, uh, and then exigent circumstances and automobile exceptions. So we've got to learn all those so that even if our flow chart on the left, we get to know a uh, probable cause, can we still get the evidence in? And it's learning all that stuff in the middle that it takes so long to understand Fourth Amendment law. Now you'll notice... Sometimes we won't have those. Then we go to the exclusionary rule. And the exclusionary rule is, is what is the whole purpose of criminal procedure. It's why I start with the exclusionary rule when I teach it. Some folks end with it, which I just think is stupid. Um, and then there, of course, there are even exceptions to the exclusionary rule. And I've got to get through all of these potential ways in which the government can still admit the evidence as a criminal defense lawyer before I can exclude the evidence under an exclusionary rule of doctrine. So there's a lot of stuff there. Almost every one of those blocks and the lines in those blocks has a case or cases that we need to understand. And because Fourth Amendment jurisprudence is so fact-intensive, it can get really frustrating and it can also get confusing. So I will refer back to this flow chart from time to time as we build our knowledge of the Fourth Amendment. And then I will point out to you maybe where the cases that we're reading fit. In the meantime, I would suggest perhaps you might want to build your own flowchart 
or structure or approach uh, to the application of the Fourth Amendment cases because it will really help you. Uh, I've talked about the steps to brief the Supreme Court case already. Uh, the exclusionary rule is relevant to our Fourth, Fifth, and Sixth Amendment limitations on police authority. And it's key for Fourth Amendment because the exclusionary rule is the game. It's the entire game from a, uh, from a lawyer's perspective. So here are the facts that I pulled out of Weeks. Weeks is a nice little um, case that, uh, that goes back a ways. He's arrested by federal authorities at work without a warrant. And cops are searching his home at the same time, also without a warrant, because the neighbor told them where the key to his house was located. And then they do a second warrantless search uh, by a magistrate looking for more evidence of illegal gambling. Those of you who read the case, what was Mr. Weeks doing? What was he doing? Lottery tickets through the mail. Lottery tickets through the mail. Um, was it a sanctioned lottery or was it an illegal lottery? Illegal. illegal lottery. Well, why would the feds be so concerned about a dude selling some lottery tickets through the mail? Yes? They the Well, back, when was this case decided? 1913. Do you think there was a lottery in 1913? No, probably not. Probably not. <laughs> why? Because gambling is immoral. And you shouldn't gamble because it's a sin just like uh, drinking is immoral and you shouldn't drink because it was a sin. But is it, is it, is it the money issue? Is it the, is it the value judgment issue? Or is there some other reasons that the feds are so hot and heavy on this particular guy? What do you think? I'm, I, this is not a trick question. What do you, when you, when you read it, what do you think was the reason that the, that the awesome might and power of the United States government chose Mr. Weeks as their victim? Lottery numbers, not taxable back then, in the back. So you think it's just a morality issue? Could be. Did, it, did anything else pop into anybody's mind? Justin? He was being very successful at running this lottery. So, so you, know, you, you can have a, an illegal side business as long as it's not noticed? Well, no, but he was just making all, all this money, maybe not paying out. It was, it was just mm. a huge chunk of money that couldn't be ignored by the, by the government. So the money. How do you, how do you set up? Yes, in the back. Why is the mail important to this case? What do you guys think? The mail is important because that's the way the feds get jurisdiction. They get jurisdiction because it's the mail. Because otherwise, it's just, it's just a crime in the state in question, right? They, they've got to establish, you know, a, a small portion of what you learn in constitutional law is actually useful when you practice. And, and that, those issues of federal jurisdiction, you know, it's important. So I think the mail is jurisdictional. And maybe they want to protect the sanctity of the mail. Um, Anything else? Yeah. I thought maybe one of the people that he scammed out of money was one of the people that had an interest in busting him. So maybe it was personal. Anybody here from the northeastern United States grow up in the northeast? What part did you grow up in? Upstate New York. Upstate New York. Uh, where? Buffalo, Syracuse? Syracuse. Uh, do you have uh, family members who, who played the lottery, who played the numbers? Uh, did they play numbers from the government and other institutions or just from the government? Just the government. Do you know who's almost been run out of business in the lottery world now? Who used to make a ton of money in the lottery world? The mob. The mob, organized crime. Huge money in gambling. Huge money. Uh, and this is at a certain level, at least arguably, they're going after a mob guy who's running numbers and paying out. My, uh, my wife's grandmother in Erie, Pennsylvania, used to uh, play the numbers with both the mob and the state, and she, she preferred the mob 
because the odds were better and they paid more. The odds were better and they paid more because they were underneath the table. Um, organized removal of money on a vice that the government's not taxing and the government doesn't have control over. So we've actually got multiple themes that we're talking about here. There's a morality component to it. There's an organized crime component to it. There's a loss of revenue component to it, right? So, you've got this going on. The Fourth Amendment says the rights of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable search and seizures shall not be violated and no warrant shall issue. But upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or objects to be seized. So, did they have a warrant for Mr. Weeks? No. They arrested him at work, and they searched his home without a warrant. Then they went back and searched his home. Should that evidence be admissible against him? Well, we would all say in 2014, 101 years after this case, well, of course it wouldn't be admissible because it should be excluded. What does the Weeks case stand for? What does, this, what does this case mean? What did they do? What did the Supreme Court do in this case? This is literally the case that establishes the exclusionary rule. They said that the remedy when the government violates the constitutional rights of the defendant is that the government is not allowed to use the evidence that they got through that constitutional violation. That was, uh, that was what the court is saying in weeks. Now that seems to us, well of course, in 1913 that was like a seismic change. Did anybody find in, in the opinion or elsewhere what the solution was when the government violated constitutional rights before the weeks case? Civil action. Yeah, Mr. Weeks could sue. He could sue in court to, for the, what, the tort. The tort in this case being what, trespass, right? Trespass and maybe if they, if they destruct, destroyed some of his property. That would, be his, um, that would be his solution. Well, let's talk about that for a moment. What do you guys think about allowing for civil action as opposed to uh, exclusion of the evidence? First of all, can you yeah, go ahead? Oh, I was going to say that, I mean, as the court here sort of discussed, it's like it's not a sufficient remedy because, first of all, if you're convicted, then you're not likely to prevail in civil action, even if you can prove the elements of the case, because, you know, I, I wouldn't think that very many juries are likely to want to give money from the government that they're going to actually pay as taxpayers to someone who's convicted of a crime. Um, just so, the you, way that the so you think that the remedy was actually uh, fictitious? So it, it was an argument that was fictitious, but that existed. Do you think, do you think that remedy existed within the law, I'm the sure ability to sue law enforcement? I'm sure you could file a lawsuit against it, but I just don't think you're likely to prevail in case. Does the fact that you're not likely to prevail, is that a, a reason to create an exclusionary rule to control the governmental power? Because this is a case that's designed to limit the power of law enforcement, Right. That's what it's doing. So is the fact that there's not a remedy that truly has teeth, uh, is that a sufficient reason to create this exclusion of evidence um, underneath the rubric of that it's a constitutional requirement? Well, if we're going to have a Fourth Amendment protection that says you can't enter my house without a search warrant, then if that's going to mean anything, there has to be significant disincentive for police to violate that right. Otherwise... It's not actually right, it's just, you know, conditions. Yeah. Um, I think it's good because it kind of creates a balance between people's privacy interests and the government's interests, where you're going to have this fictitious remedy where, sure, in theory, you know, defendants could sue, but I mean, there's no, you know, real way for them to win, whereas this kind of creates a better balance. Does, does the court, in the opinion, tell us where the authority for or the, um, 
the, the support for applying this exclusionary standard comes from. Because if we go back and look um, at the Fourth Amendment, oops, sorry, I went, went too far. I see the limitations that the Constitution places on the government, right? I see the establishment of the right, but I don't see an establishment of the remedy from the standpoint of the evidence being excluded. I mean, if the Founding Fathers wanted the evidence to be excluded, you just add a sentence. Now, in the event that the government, that, uh, that the government violates the aforementioned right, uh, evidence derived from that violation is inadmissible at trial. That sentence is not there. So where did they get this idea that it's okay? I mean, where's the where's the underpinning? Where's the I, I I get emotionally that it makes sense to me. I buy the common sense argument that it's a limitation on police power and that we ought to limit police power because unfettered power uh, is uh, is a guarantee of abuse. It's just a question of when, not if. I, I buy into all of that. I just want to know structurally how does the court justify this idea? What's the what's the reason that it's okay? In the back. I think they look at um, pre amendment cases and situations where basically they look at why the amendment was created, uh, what they were trying to prevent the government from doing. Um, how far back do they go when they talk about what they were trying to prevent the government from doing? Uh, they, they look at England, and they also look at the colonies. Um. <coughs> so they look at abuses of power by the authority before the rule was established. Do they point us to anything after those colonial abuses to argue for this limitation on law enforcement. Leon? Um, I think they, they discussed that it's more so them in, uh, imposing limitations on the police officers and the attorneys because they're officers of the court. And, I mean, in the here they say the right of the court to deal with papers and documents in the possession of the district attorney and other officers to recognize that they list, like, earlier Supreme Court cases. Well, why the heck are they talking about documents and officers of the court sort of pulling the law enforcement up to be part of the, the court system. I mean, they are. They, call, they refer to them as officers of the court. Why? Because, well, I guess it's kind of vain to say it like this, but because then by calling them that, they can say they're subject to the authority of the court. Yeah, they're trying to establish their authority to create this rule. They're looking for the arguments as to why this rule is valid. And one of them they use is officers of the court. Another one they use is the historical context of why the rule was created to begin with. But riddle me this, Batman. If that was important from the standpoint of the post-violation from a court perspective, why is there not an exclusionary rule um, codicil portion of the Constitution? Why is it not in the, I mean, is it in it? And I just can't find it. Does the court point to, in weeks, any portion of the Constitution, the written word, that is uh, in support of this exclusionary rule that they've created? Now, they've, they've established their authority by saying, hey, look, it's part of the court system. We oversee the court system. We need to control the power of the cops. Uh, ergo kumquat, we're going to do this. I get that. Those of you who don't know the Latin, ergo kumquat, therefore the kumquat. Um, I get that, but where's the real validation? Where's the true validity for doing this? I think it's an interesting question. I, I mean, guys, this, this course exists. All of these lawyers making all this money doing Fourth Amendment work exists because of this exclusionary rule. Does the Constitution establish a right to criminal trial? It does, right? Does it establish a right to have your cases heard by a jury or your peers? Yeah, it does. 
Is there even a constitutional right to a civil trial? Yes, there is. So if they did all those things, could they not have contemplated that um, sometimes law enforcement will do the wrong thing and the, and the way to control law enforcement is to, is to just not let that evidence in? They, they did not do that. So where's the legal argument for this exclusionary rule other than it's so because we said so? In the back. That's an interesting thought. Can you find that analysis in the opinion, though? Because what we're trying to do now is to try to buttress it after the fact. You could make an argument that that incriminating information comes from it. But that would only take care of the things that I had written that were attributable as statements by me. It wouldn't take care of the things that I would possess. It would only take care of the things that I had said that were within my control that I hadn't shared and put public. So maybe a journal or something like that. Yeah? I was just going to say, I think they were concerned that if they allowed the evidence in, it would swallow the entire purpose of the Fourth Amendment protection. Ah. Uh, this exclusionary rule must exist because if it does not exist, the right does not exist. Is that what they're saying? Is that it was implied in the creation of the right? That the creation of the right must include a remedy that works. The remedy that we've historically relied upon doesn't work. Therefore, there must be another remedy that is encompassed in the assertion of this right. And so in federal court, we're now going to exclude evidence where the cops violate the Fourth Amendment right of the uh, of the accused. So police officers, do your job. Get a warrant. Have probable cause. Now, if you think, if you think back, 19, whoops, 1913 is a long time ago. And the makeup of law enforcement, the training of law enforcement, and the way in which law enforcement interacted with uh, well-heeled society and society that was not well-heeled was fundamentally different. Um, it, it is not even remotely like law enforcement is today. There were concerns that, um, that there was the possibility of the overreaching of law enforcement, of the federal government getting involved too much, and law enforcement intruding into the rights of the individual. And we need to control that uh, because... Uh, this federal government thing is really trying to tell these states what to do. Well, does Weeks apply to everybody, or does Weeks just apply to the federal government? From the opinion, what do you think? Yeah. Um, Bill Buck. I got, God, I'm going to ride that like a horse. Uh, that's fine. Yeah. Um, Weeks just applies It's actually to Alan, right? Yes, sir. I, I, had a tr I had trouble remembering because in my head he's Bill Buck. <laughs> I once had a student who sat up front for the entire semester. I had a seating chart. I don't do that anymore. And she swapped with her next door neighbor after the first day of class. And I called her by the seating chart name for the entire semester. And that was not her name. And then she showed up in my class the next semester. I was so glad. Oh, Susan, I'm so happy to see you. She said, Professor Rose, my name is Melanie. I said, like hell it is. I called her Susan. Bilbo, you were saying Yeah, that's an open question as to whether or not it applies to the states, right? Now, this is 1913, uh, less than 50 years after the end of the Civil War, maybe 40, 30-something, 30, 30 40-something years after the end of Reconstruction. Uh, do you think that states below the Mason-Dixon line or some states out west have any desire for the federal government to tell them how their state-run criminal law system should work. Because what the exclusionary rule says is, yeah, he did it, he's guilty, and you found the evidence, but we're not going to let you use it. We're not going to let you use it. It was a, a tremendous issue. 
<coughs> so what did the court have to do? Matt v. Ohio. Which, by the way, was in 1957 that the event occurred 44 years after the week's opinion was decided. And that's a, that's a picture of Ms. Dolry Matt. Cleveland, Ohio. I don't think she should have ever gone to trial just because she had to leave in Cle live in Cleveland. <coughs> so in Matt, the cops go to her house looking for a suspect in a bomb. She refuses to let them in. <coughs> Eventually they go in after several hours of surveillance over the objections of her lawyer and without a warrant. Uh, she demands to see the warrant. They show her a piece of paper, and she grabs and stuffs it down her shirt. They have a fight. She's subdued and handcuffed. Her clothes, suitcases, and other area of the house were searched, and the obscene materials were discovered. <coughs> At trial, no warrant was produced, and no explanation for the lack of a warrant was provided. Did anybody think to ask what the obscene materials that were discovered actually were? Was it communist propaganda? Yep. <coughs> what does Wikipedia say? Wikipedia said that um, they, there was confusion on the record that there might be communist propaganda, but they're actually talking about the guy they were looking for in the bombing originally. Mm -hmm. When they got in, they found just the scene. I don't know if they have seen the scene. Bilbo? I believe in the concurring opinion, the judge actually says it was pornographic. Pornographic material. There's always somebody who focuses on the obscenity. Yeah. There's a four little pamphlets, a My. couple of photos, and a pencil doodling. Considered pornographic. Considered pornographic. Did they break into her house to, to stop the widespread sale of pornography? Were they looking for a communist? What was Dole Re involved in? What was Miss Mapp involved in? Why were they focusing on her? Was it <coughs> was it her home? Was she running a boarding house? How did she wind up in this position? What does Wikipedia tell us? I know she had a civil suit going on. Is she one of these people? I almost said chick, and that would be inappropriate. Is she one of these folks who just gets sideways with the government and fights with them about things? I'm not giving you my social security number because that's the mark of the devil, but I want my driver's license. Sound familiar? Is she, is she, just, is she just contrary? Or is she a target for some other reason? Well, look at her picture. Cleveland, Ohio. What's 1957 historically? What's going on in the United States? Hmm? Civil rights. Huge issue. Huge issue. Does anybody talk about this being a civil rights issue in the opinion? Do they even talk about the race of Ms. Mapp at any point? Does anybody mention it? I wonder if the cops were looking at that place because she was involved in the civil rights movement and, and you know, these communist sympathizers or these anti-government um, folks were part of the process and the cops were trying to shut that down and control it because they're worried about unrest. Now, I mean, that's a nice way to say it. Another way to say it is that they're trying to... Uh, to keep people in their place. I don't know. I wasn't in Cleveland in 1957. It could have even been both. So she's already on the radar because she's, to use a phrase that has all sorts of emotional connotations, getting uppity. She didn't know her place. We're watching this woman. Uh, so let's find a way to, you know, rouse her out a little bit. <coughs> Now, I'm not sure. If you go and read the history about uh, Ms. Mapp, you'll find it. There are arguments on, both, on, on multiple sides of all those issues that I've just sort of tossed out there. 
Uh, and, you know, the funny thing about uh, civil unrest and civil disobedience in the civil rights movement is we look back at it through the patina of history and we think, oh, all those lovely, innocent folks marching hand in hand to stop oppression when really you had multiple constituencies involved in multiple things. And what else was going on in the United States in the 1950s, other than civil rights? How many of you have heard of Senator Joseph McCarthy? The Red Scare. The Red Scare. Uh, the, uh, the Committee on Un-American Activities in the Congress. The artists who were blacklisted and not, uh, not allowed to work because they were quote-unquote communist supervisors. Uh, communist sympathizers or members of the party. I actually have a member of my own family. Uh, there are over 1,500 pages of FBI surveillance on him uh, during this time frame in the 30s, the 40s, and the 50s uh, because he was involved in, a, uh, in an institution that trained folks in civil disobedience, both for civil rights and for textile workers in the, in the Deep South, a little place called the Highlander Folk School. Uh, and they watched him for 1,500 pages of FBI surveillance. You know what he was eventually, uh, how they eventually shut the school down? They had beer in the refrigerator, and people could take a beer and put money in the, in the till to buy more beer, and that was a violation of the sales tax in Tennessee. That's how they shut him down. So there's something else going on here with Ms. Matt. Now, why is it interesting to us? Interesting to us. Well, by 1957, you got the civil rights movement that's coming on. You, we kind of petered out on the issue of we're terrified of the Russians, they're going to blow us up. Uh, at least from the standpoint of the way the Red Scare was done. Where it was literally, you know, better dead than red. The John Birch Society. Um, there's a great uh, Chad Mitchell trio song making fun of the John Birch Society. Has anyone in this room heard it? If someone can stand up and sing it right now, I will let you out of class this moment. No, no, no. Now wait, stop, Leon. <laughs> when I ask a question like that, it is not, hey, dude, Google it really quick. It's do you actually know it as part of your own life? No one here has heard the song of the John Birch Society. What about your friendly liberal neighborhood Ku Klux Klan? Wow, you're deficient in your education. I'll have to do something to correct that. Um, so you've got these multiple social issues going on. You've got the court sitting on top of this. When was Brown versus Board of Education decided? 54. So they've already desegregated the schools. Is Dr. Martin Luther King alive and well in 1957? I wonder what he's doing in the Deep South right now. This is the very end of Eisenhower before all of the turmoil of Kennedy comes on. It's a real flashpoint time in the United States. And the federal government doesn't have control of state governments and state law enforcement. So right now, as all this is going on, you know, a cop down in Alabama can break into somebody's house, have no probable cause, rouse them out, find the evidence, shut down the civil rights, and the remedy for that person, as they sit in you know, the Tishomingo County Jail or wherever the heck it is, is to file a civil suit against the cop in the same court system that the cop is an officer therein. So MAP is an opportunity to say, hey, guys, that exclusionary rule, it applies to every state, not just the federal government. And that's the purpose of this case. So how did they do that? How did they do that? What's the legal ruling? Due process clause of the 14th Due process clause of the 14th Amendment. Historically, why was the 14th Amendment passed? What was the reason historically that the 14th Amendment was passed? Right after slavery? Right at, well, 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. Right after slavery, right after, you know, end of the Civil War, I'd have to go back and look at the timeline, but what's it saying? It's saying the federal government is the supreme law in the land and all laws apply to everyone equally. And 14th due process is to ensure that the constitutional standards that exist federally 
also exist in every state government. It's the reason that states can't pass laws that give more power to the state than the federal government has. You know, the federal government sets the floor of individual rights in every other place in the United States. It's not the ceiling. So now our state constitutions and our state laws are involved in defining those areas where the federal government hasn't spoken, but we as a people want to express an additional right or additional protection. Living in Florida, you have some cool things as a result of that. You've got the Sunshine Law. That's not required. It's not a federal law. But we say we want to be able to look into what our government is doing uh, at, at multiple levels. That's a neat thing about the state of Florida. Another neat thing about the state of Florida is that if you're in a felony trial and you're the defendant, you have the right to depose witnesses before trial, a right that's been created in the state of Florida, a right that's greater than the right to trial at the federal level. But before MAP, the state laws could be below the federal standard. And the argument was the state has the right to, to govern its own people the way it wants. So when someone says state, state's rights to you, that's got a great emotional idea of we'll all rule ourselves and, and why should Washington, D.C. tell me what to do. But at the same time, it has a dark underbelly of that way we could treat anybody the way we want as long as most of us agree that's what we want to do. You know, and that's, if you don't understand the history of that stuff, it, it doesn't quite fit uh, in your head in that way. I, I find it uh, to be more than a little bit fascinating for that reason. Right. So as I'm, as I'm looking at MAP, and, and you may be thinking, hey, how should I think about this? Well, I've got a Fourth Amendment question. If I know who was doing the search, what they were looking for, why they were there, what suspicion did they have, was there a warrant, and where did they look? Those questions are very helpful to me to seeing whether or not there's a game being played by the cops. So, for example, if they say, we're conducting the search, we're looking for bomb-making materials. We're looking for bomb-making materials because we've got a tip that there may be a terrorist in that house making bombs. And then they go into the house and they unroll all the socks and find crack cocaine. Were they really looking for bomb-making materials, or did they just use the excuse of the bomb-making materials to get in and rouse the house and look for whatever they wanted? These who, what, um, and where questions can be helpful to us as we sort of sort through these Fourth Amendment cases. And then, of course, we look back at the Fourth Amendment, and I want to leave you today with this broad Fourth Amendment template that, that I would suggest to you that as, we, as you do your reading... And I think our next class period is next Wednesday, right? As you do your reading and you're reading the case, ask yourself, who is this amendment applied to? Who are they trying to apply to? Was there a search or was there a seizure or was there both? Can I identify when the search began and when the search ended? Were there multiple searches or just one word search? What did they take? Did the cops have probable cause? If they had probable cause, at what point did they have it? When did they get the probable cause? Uh, was there a requirement for a warrant? And then when the cops did the search, were they reasonable in their search? And the facts will help us decide whether or not it's reasonable, right? And then what happened in this particular case if there was a violation of the Fourth Amendment? Because sometimes I'll have a violation of the Fourth Amendment, and as a result, the evidence will be excluded. Sometimes I'll have a violation of the Fourth Amendment, and the court will go, uh-oh, yes, the Fourth Amendment was violated, but, and that but is an exception that comes into being in the law. It's a way around the constitutional requirement that the evidence is excluded. This template right here will be helpful to us for the next four or five cases that we read because it will get us focused in the way that we need to be focused uh, to effectively uh, get through them. It's 11.49, class ends at 11.55. What questions do you have of me right now?